Good evening, brothers and sisters, children of all ages, God's children, that is. Hope you guys are doing great out there. This is Mikayo coming to you via satellite, I suppose. I don't really know how it gets to you, but uh, coming to you in the Lord, with the Lord, with the Spirit of the Lord. That's my prayer. Before I start this evening, I pray that God would fill me with His Spirit and help me to share that Spirit with you. So I hope it is coming across to you as we speak. Uh, it's good to be with you guys. And, uh, you know, I tried to do something every day. And uh, unfortunately, I just can't do it <laughs> until I get more support for the channel. Uh, because i uh, got to do all the other things i got to do in life. Uh, as more support comes in, I'll be able to spend more time. And I want to spend more time uh, doing shows for you guys. Uh, but unfortunately, I just can't um, until we get that we get the level of support that we need. Um, don't use Square. That's what I found out today. Wow. I, I thought uh, maybe they were an alternative. But then I did remember in the back of my mind that JD uh, of Twitter uh, is actually the one behind it. So I'm like, well, it's not surprising that they're just as devilish as... Uh, as PayPal with Soros behind it. I mean, you can't, you can't win, you know, how, how you, how are you going to make payments for anything when every, everything's owned by the devil? You know, it's, it's very challenging. Um, so I encourage you to use Zelle. Um, I haven't heard anything negative about that yet, but today I experienced something with Square. that was like, Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, they want your firstborn child. Uh, they want pictures of the inside of your intestines. I mean, that's the level of, of, of invasion that they want to do to you to use their service um, and just just happened today I didn't have that problem before but uh, just happened today I'm like you gotta be kidding no way so um, so I'm no longer promoting uh, that uh, that option um, but if you do want to use PayPal yeah I know source is behind it but uh, it's an option for you I know a lot of people use it and uh, Zelle I haven't heard anything real negative about Zelle I think they're kind of number three after I think the cash app which is square and then PayPal I think is the next one Venmo or whatever so um, so Zelle will be the next one and that that goes directly to support us and if you want to see more and hear more of this content uh, and you want to help support this channel we need your support um, and uh, as little as a buck a month could help a buck a day a buck a week whatever works for you um, but uh, if you can help us out that would be great and then I can come and I can do more more videos for you it's basically boils down to that you know the more support we get the more I can come to you and and talk um, but I'm grateful to be with you guys tonight and I'm glad I had a little time I was able to make uh, to uh, to put this together uh, it's been in my heart ever since uh, I heard about the supposed retreat uh, quote unquote of the Russians and I thought yeah right give me a break you got your whole army you got like hundreds of thousands of soldiers and thousands of tanks and and everything else and you're just gonna go oh just kidding just kidding we're going home now <laughs> don't think so don't think so you know it's the fame i'm reminded of the famous trojan horse from the trojan and spartan war uh as you see in the picture here and uh you know the spartans were dumb enough to think oh they just went home oh well, that's nice oh, and they left us a gift they they took time after fighting a battle they, they took time to destroy their ships and make this gift for us um but then how did they leave where, where are they <laughs> if they use their ships do you ever think about these things you know this, this is the problem we have with the human race is we don't think about anything you know we just sort of take whatever's given to us and go along with the flow and uh and so the trojans you know destroyed their ships so they could build this i mean what an idea i mean who came up with this idea and the fact that they actually did it um and the fact that they actually bought it is is what's so amazing about it um that they built this trojan horse and uh and then got inside of it and and waited for them to wheel it into the city so that at night they could come out and attack and that's what they did so that's that's what Putin's doing here, guys. I mean, when he re re withdraws 7,000, I mean, that's like nothing compared to his whole army being on the border. That's like those are all the ones he had to send back, you know, uh, for uh, to the mechanic, you know, whatever to get fixed. You know, there's I mean, you bring that much equipment out there. You're bound to have tons of equipment that's not working too well. 
And so that's probably what that 7,000 was. But sure, you want to believe he's retreating? Sure, you know. But um, obviously he's not. And uh, I think the whole thing about the him attacking yesterday uh, was also a ruse. I mean, that's the West pushing that agenda, right? And so, you know, they're pushing, pushing, pushing because they really want this this war, the, the globalist, insane, psychotic cabal. They can't wait to have this war. So they're pushing and pushing. And so, of course, he's not going to attack when you say he's going to attack. I mean, that just doesn't even make sense. I mean, that's that's war 101. You never do it when the enemy thinks you're going to do it. That would that would be ridiculous. So, you know, I suppose they could keep saying that every day and he's not going to attack, but they want him to attack. See, that's that's the irony of it. But there's a lot of dynamics going on here. We're going to try to touch on at least a good portion of that today, hopefully. Um, listen, if you haven't already seen uh, the last video I did, you got to go watch that video. You don't have to do it right now necessarily. You can listen to this one first if you want. But you got to go check out that video. And let me just show you that real quick, right quick. Um, if you go to uh, Mikhail Messenger YouTube channel, uh, it's not the most exciting of my pictures here, but uh, it doesn't stand out the most, I, I guess. But it's this one here. It's what else must happen before the rapture, okay? I know it's three hours. Put it on fast if you need to. Doesn't bother me at all as long as you get the content. There's content in there that you should get, okay? That's very, very important. It's biblical, biblically based. And uh, as always, I always come to you biblically based as, as much as possible. Um, you know, some things are just in the news or whatever's happening in the world, but I always try my best to tie that into Scripture because that's ultimately what we're following. We're following God and His Word. So um, it's tied into Scripture. Uh, very, some very interesting things. I'm going to touch a little bit on some of that today. Um, and then I'm going to touch on a little bit of some new things today and uh, and talk to you a little bit about the strategy of what's going on right now, you know, because this is the art of war, as talked about by Sun Tzu. Many like to quote, however, Sun Tzu didn't come around to the sixth century. And as we're going to see today, a lot of what he was getting, that's right in the Bible. It always goes back to the Bible, guys. The Bible is way older than Sun Tzu, okay? So I'm not saying that Sun Tzu didn't have some good insights here, but ultimately you could find these insights, most of them, if not all of them, in Scripture as well. So let's look at a couple of these things that he says, and then we're going to look at some Scriptures that kind of tie into some of that, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world right now and how this all relates. Sound good? Give me a shout-out out there. I see some people are watching, so give me a shout-out. Uh, in the chat box there, I'm always, as always, I'm always going to tune into the chat box. I want to thank all the new subscribers. The channel is growing by leaps and bounds, so that's that's really encouraging. Um, you know, we just we're hit another we hit another milestone in subscribers, and we're about to hit another one. So really appreciate that. Um, so thanks for your support. Uh, but be sure to subscribe also to chat uh, in the box over here, and uh, just hit the subscription button. Within a minute, you'll be chatting with me right here. Uh, in the chat box okay so let me know you're out there I want to know you guys are there and um, want to hear your thoughts on what I'm sharing with you today so Sun Tzu okay so he wrote a famous book called the art of war okay and here's some quotes out of that book and many basically it's kind of required reading for anybody in the military anybody who's who's going to be going into war um, it's it's a famous book uh, strategy book for for war but it, you know it's it, as it's kind of like the book of Proverbs it, it applies to life too but um, but obviously war is the extreme of, of that expression of how to deal with your enemies and things like that. So let me read you a couple of these and then I'm going to show you some scriptures that kind of tie into a little bit of what we see here from Mr. Sun Tzu. And, um, you know, as I put in the title there uh, for today's video, it's let me go back to that real, real quick for you. Uh, when they say peace and safety, right? So, um, you know, and I really probably should have shared that scripture first. So let me let me just share that scripture real quick so that you know exactly what I'm talking about. I know some of you do already, but some of you don't. So let me let me just show you that scripture real quick and then we will um, we'll be off and running for the rest of it. Let me just get over here. As usual, my computer's running real slow because it just can't handle everything I want to do with it. All right, let me go over here and um, uh, 
what is this? First Thessalonians five. Let's take a look there real quick, right quick. Good old First Thessalonians. Okay, see what is this? So I'm using a different browser. I was hoping. I unfortunately it's not the case. I was hoping this browser would be better, lighter. I'm looking for the best, fastest browser because I'm always it always gets slowed sluggish when I'm streaming. So I'm always looking for a better browser to use. And unfortunately, this one didn't come through. Thought it might, but not so great. Okay, so, but I already had everything opened on it, so I'm kind of stuck using it for tonight. So, okay, so 1 Thessalonians 5. And uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, now this is right after 1 Thessalonians 4 that talks about the arpazo, a.k.a. rapture. Many people call it the rapture. That The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the word arpazo is. That means the snatching away. When God's going to take us away to be with him in heaven, he comes in the clouds, and we go up to meet him in heaven along with the dead in Christ, who rise first. And so 1 Thessalonians 5 immediately follows that. And it says, Now, brothers, about times and dates, zoom in just a touch here for you. See, what's going on? <laughs> I don't understand. What's wrong with this? It just goes to like random ads and stuff. I think this is like a Russian. It's Russian propaganda. I think it's a Russian browser, actually. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But anyway, um, let me just take a look. So, okay, so it says, Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Now, I tell you, every time, I mean, virtually every time I come across a scripture that has to do with end times, labor pains of a pregnant woman are always involved. <laughs> I mean... I mean, why is this the analogy? I, I don't know. I, I guess because we all feel that. We feel like like a pregnant woman right now, like about to give birth. Like you can feel it in the air. You can feel it in the world. It's like we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. We know it's coming and it's going to come any second and poosh, the baby comes. And I mean, every time and every scripture I read about end times, there's always the pain of labor. Labor pains are always involved. Jesus himself said it would be like the labor pains. I mean, this is a thing. You know, so anyway, so he says, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. There it goes again. Not sure why it's doing that. Didn't click any ad. Okay. First Thessalonians. Uh, okay. Sorry, guys. I'm using a new browser and it's not great. Okay. So. But you brothers are not in darkness, so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. You're all sons of the night, of the light, and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Okay, so um, this is what we're talking about here on that opening thing. When they say peace and safety, destruction will come suddenly. Well, when they're saying something like Russia is retreating, hey, don't worry, Russia's retreating. It's peace and safety. Or Russia's saying, no, we're not going to invade Ukraine. Peace and safety, peace and safety, peace and safety. Don't worry about it. There's no war. War? What, what war? What are you talking about? No, there's not going to be a war, right? That's, that's what we're talking about. When they're saying peace and safety, that's when destruction will come suddenly like labor pains on a pregnant woman, okay? Like a thief in the night, Jesus describes it. It comes like a thief in the night. So a thief in the night surprises you. You don't expect him coming. Just like the ten uh, virgins, right? When the bridegroom shows up, it's a surprise. They're like, oh, no, he's here. We weren't ready for it. Ah, I don't have my oil. Help help me, right? That's how it's going to be, guys. That's how it's going to be when the destruction comes, and that's how it's going to be when Jesus comes. So it's suddenly, it's unexpected. It's when people are saying peace and safety. Now, they're saying peace and safety. It doesn't mean it is peace and safety, okay? Don't confuse the two because sometimes we say, Oh, well, it's got to be this peace and safety. Now, it is a time like Noah where people are still giving in marriage and still doing business and so forth. And we're still in those times. I know some countries are not not so in them as as the rest. Uh, you know, some countries are in a, in a lot of stress right now, a lot of struggle right now. But we're still kind of eking out an existence of business and giving in marriage and all the kind of regular things of life, buying and selling and so forth. And people are still saying peace and safety. Oh, don't worry about it. Nah, it'll blow over. You know, people... You know, people are not clued in, you know, they, they're still thinking it's going to go back to normal, quote unquote. Right. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this peace and safety. So Sun Tzu, right, he's talking in the art of war. He's saying 
He's saying it's, it's, there's always deception. There's always deception. So when people are saying peace and safety, it's not peace and safety. And when everything looks good and hunky-dory, it's not good and hunky-dory. And, you know, it's, it's not so much about being negative or, you know, having a glass half empty sort of attitude. It's just seeing beyond the veil. It's understanding that God is doing something, the devil is doing something, and that's in the spiritual realm that we don't see. So we kind of, we kind of take it for granted and we kind of think, oh, well, you know, uh, life is, life is fine, you know, and we sort of, we, we don't look beyond and realize that there is a spiritual war going on that it will, is, and will manifest in the physical realm as well. But part of the, you know, the devil is a liar, right? Everybody knows that phrase. The devil is a liar, right? So the devil is a liar and, uh, he's always out to deceive. You know, lying is his mother tongue. That's what Jesus says. He was a liar from the beginning. There's no truth in him, Right. And so that's his whole M.O., is to be a deceitful liar. And as Christians and as those who follow God, we're like, no, we're about the truth, man. And we, we want to be honest and upfront and so forth. We don't believe in secrecy, as JFK says. But we have to be shrewd because we have to understand, but the devil is, right? The devil is about secrecy and the devil is about evil and deception and, and hiding all of that. So we have to be aware of that. So in war... When we're fighting a spiritual battle with the devil, well, it manifests ultimately in this physical war that we're going into now, right? And so Sun Tzu, a couple quotes here. Um, he says, appear weak when you are strong and strong when you are weak, right? So it's always the opposite, right? So if he says we're not invading, of course he's invading. He's just not going to tell you. He's not going to say, yeah, we're invading. We'll, we'll be there on Wednesday. No, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. That's ridiculous, right? So nobody in their right mind who's going to go to war is going to first tell you when they're going to war. And secondly, you know, they're not going to announce it with trumpets and they're not going to tell you what they're doing and how they're doing it. They're not going to be honest about it, right? The supreme art of war is to subdue your enemy without fighting. Now, that's what we've been experiencing with this whole uh, get poisoned nonsense, right? Is they've been able to get the enemy. Now, to the globalist, the enemy is you. Okay, they hate people. They want to destroy all the people. They want 90% of the population gone. Go look at the Georgia Guidestones. 500,000, 500 million is what they want left, right? In the whole world out of 7 billion. So 90% of the population gone, right? They, they want to get rid of you. And so the best thing is that they can get you to get rid of yourself, right? So, hey, get you to line up and take a poison. Wow, genius. They don't have to, they don't have to raise a finger. They don't have to fire a shot, quote unquote. Uh, they, they'll just give you one. <laughs> so um, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting, right? So if you never have to actually go into war, but you can actually subdue the enemy, in this case, eliminate the enemy, how much better, right? If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a, of a hundred battles. If you know yourself and not the enemy for every victory gained, you also suffer defeat. Okay, let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. That's exactly what we just read about peace and safety, right? So, dark and impenetrable, like a thief in the night, right? And as imp impenetrable as night. And when you move, suddenly, boom, like a thunderbolt, it'll come like labor pains, right? That's the way. That's the way. That's the way God says it would be, and that's the way it is. Supreme, uh, let, me, let me go down. Okay, this one. All warfare is based on deception. Okay, that's what you have to understand. So they're not, Putin's not going to come out and say, yes, of course, that's what we're doing. No, he's using it as a ruse. He's using it as a chance to make fun of the West. It's like, haha, I slept in today. I, I wasn't able to bomb you. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. You know, most likely I'll kill you in the morning, Wesley, you know, from Prince of <laughs> Princess Bride. You know, it's like, good work today. Most likely I'll kill you in the morning. So that's, that's Putin, you know, he's, he's just having fun. He's, he's mocking us and having fun. And, and his ambassador is like, you know, it's kind of like what Elijah was doing with the prophets of Baal. Like, oh, is your God asleep? Well, maybe shout louder. You know, wake him up. Come on. Let's go. Let's see. Let's see your God Baal. Oh, he must be awesome. Let's check that out. Right. So, you know, he's just he's goading them. He's goading them. And he's goading them because ultimately the globalists want the war. They're the ones who want the war. But they want to try to pin it on Putin. Oh, it's Putin's fault. He's the one that started the war. He wanted to take Ukraine and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not saying Putin doesn't have any motives. Everybody's got motives, right? And Putin's no saint, quote unquote. I, I, I can't speak for his, his relationship with God or anything, but all, all I can say is he's got his evil past, right? We know that. He was a general in the KGB during the USSR. I mean, the guy is, didn't come to power for nothing. But 
you know, because of that, he understands this game better than better than the loony, lunatics who are who who are trying to take over the asylum. So all warfare is based on deception. Hence, we when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When it's Putin saying, "Oh, you know, uh, you know, maybe we can't be as powerful as NATO, but you know, we still got some things. You know, it's just something to be aware of." When using our forces, we must appear inactive. Oh yeah, I'm I'm retreating. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why I sent seven thousand back to get mechanical repairs. <laughs> you know, give me a break. Seven thousand out of the hundreds of thousands of of guy of people there, and the, you know, I, I don't know if he has a hundred thousand vehicles, but more tens of thousands of vehicles, right? So seven thousand is nothing. I'm sure there's plenty of things that need new tires and new tracks, or oh, we got to fix this one, or this one hasn't been tuned up in a while. So they probably do that on a regular basis. But while he's moving seven thousand back, he moves another twenty thousand in, right? But he's keeping those hidden. He says, when we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. So that's why, that's what comes to, and, and when far away, we must make him believe we are near. So this whole thing of him invading Ukraine, he's lining everything up on Ukraine, it makes you got to question, hmm, where's he really going to go? Right? Because that's so obvious. It's just obvious. He's lining everything up there because that's what they expect him to do. And so he's kind of fulfilling that expectation. But meanwhile, other things are going on in other places. And it makes you wonder, is Ukraine just a distraction, just a ruse? Is, is it just another one of his chess playing moves, the Russian chess players, because they're known for being very tactical in that way? So something to think about. And I want to look in the Bible for a couple examples of this. So Sun Tzu, again, 6th century, right? So after Christ, 600 years after Christ, he's coming out with these pithy thoughts. But really, it was thousands of years before that you could see examples of this in the good old Bible, because obviously that is the source. God is the source of all. So let's take a look over here in Joshua. And I want to tell you a story about the Gibeonites, okay? Now, the Gibeonites, um, see, it keeps doing this. It, it'll just jump to like some random page. I mean, there's nothing on this page that I'm clicking to, to take it there. So don't use this browser. That's my recommendation. Uh, <laughs> but I have to use it today. So, okay. So let's take a look at this in Joshua about the, the Gibeonites. Okay, so the Gibeonites were some guys who lived near, um, I wanna change this over to this. Of course, it messed up my whole page. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Okay, let me go over here. Okay, New International Version, 1984. And why do I use that version? Because that's a version where they came together and and we can read in the beginning of the 1904 version, but different denominations came together to make an English version that was translatable. But in 2011, they got woke. You know, they got woke in their translation. Still some good things in that version too, but I try to just stick with, let's just stick with the Bible and not all the woke uh, interjections. Okay, the Gimeonite deception. And King James, of course, is wonderful as well. They're all great. What really matters is that you go back to the original Greek and Hebrew text. And so whatever version you want to use in English, I mean, some do get a little out there and a little off of, off the track. But anyway, the Gibeonite deception. Now, when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, those in the hill country in the western foothills and along the entire coast of the Great Sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. Okay. However... When the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, not artificial intelligence, they resorted to a ruse. Mm, okay, so this is a biblical thing, okay? This has been going on in wars since the dawn of man. I mean, you can even go back to, you know, other fights even before Joshua. Um, arguably, you could, you could, there's other uh, times in the Bible, even like I think of uh, Jacob and Esau, you know, there's, there's some rusing going on there been a lot of ruses in the Bible. So here's one, though, specifically in relation to battle and war. So they resort to a ruse because they're like, man, we can't fight these guys. So let's use a different approach. Okay. So he says, they went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. Mm, okay. So basically, they're, they're a close country. They're afraid Joshua's going to come and destroy them. So they're like, man, we got to make a treaty with these guys. 
um, but they probably don't want to make a treaty with us because we're right next door and they want this land. So let's pretend that we're from far away and we'll put on old clothes like we've been traveling for months and our food is old and everything's just, you know, decrepit on us so that they believe. So they're acting. They're pretending like David when he was acting, like Jesus when he was acting. There's a lot of acting in the Bible. Um, anyway, the men of Israel said to the Hivites, but perhaps you live near us. Okay, see, it did it again. Why is it doing this? Sorry, guys. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, anyway, it says, uh, the men of Israel said to him, so, so the men of Israel kind of caught on. They're like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe you're nearby. Oh, uh, you know, obviously, that's an obvious thing to think. But they didn't obviously go far enough to find out if they really were. How then can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, who are you and where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt. Makes me think of Herod when he was lying to the, the, the Magi. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new. But see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. There it goes again. Don't understand why it's doing that. Um, hold on. Hold on. Oh, man. Okay. Sorry, guys. Never used this browser before, and it's it's got issues. Okay, um, it just goes to random ad sites or something in the middle of whatever. So you get the gist, okay? So these guys are coming from a long journey. They're pretending to be from a long a long way off, and they're trying to psych out the Jews and make them think that they are not nearby neighbors that they're about to attack, right? So they're trying to get them to to trick them into making a treaty with them, which. To me, I would think, well, if you trick them into a treaty, then the treaty doesn't count. But, you know, as we'll see, why, why, what, what happens here? Let's see. So the men of Israel sampled their provisions in verse 14, but did not inquire of the Lord. Ah, ah, aha, aha, taste the soup. Okay, the men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. See? This is the problem, guys. We have to keep talking to God here, and all the more so. We need to be communicating and asking God for his guidance and his insight on what is happening in the world. If we're not praying to God, if we're not talking to God about this, we're not saying, well, what is Putin really doing and what is the cabal really doing and so forth? If we just kind of take everything at face value, then we are going to be deceived. And that is exactly what happens here. These guys get deceived because they don't go to God and say, is it true what these guys are saying, God? Are these guys really from a long way off or are they our neighbors? Are they trying to trick us? What's going on here? So it says, then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out on the third day. Okay, so three days later, there it goes again. Three days later, right, they, they find out the truth. They find out the truth. They find out that these guys really are their neighbors. And, and so... Wow. Sorry about this. I can't believe this, this thing. Okay. So they find out they really are their neighbors. And so they set out, the Israelites set out on the third day and come to the cities, Gibeon, Kephirath, Beeroth, and Kiriath, Jerem. So they track them down. They basically say, what's up with this? But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assemblies had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. So they didn't inquire of God, but they gave an oath to, that they would not fight them, a treaty, in the name of God. And so now, now they, they violate a covenant that they've made to God if they go back on that. See, so they're, they're in a bind now. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders, uh, all the leaders, man, all right, I'm just kidding. I'm just going to keep reading this. Okay, all the leaders, um, uh, all the leaders of the whole congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. 
This we will do to them, even let them live, so that the wrath, their wrath will not be upon us for oath which we swore to them. I'm reading a different version now. but The leader said to them, Let them live, so they became hewers of wood and drawers of water for the whole congregation, just as the leaders had spoken to them. Then Joshua called for them and spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us, saying we are from very far away when you are living within our land? Now therefore you are cursed. You shall never cease being slaves, both hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. So they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told your servants that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and destroy all the, the inhabitants of the land before you, Therefore, we heard, uh, we feared greatly. Oh, man. We feared greatly. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It would take me longer to switch to another thing right now, so I'm just going to get through this, and then we, you know, hopefully won't have this problem anymore. Um, so we feared greatly, so we basically came to you, and we faked you out, right? We feared greatly, um, and so behold, we're in your hands. Do as it seems good and write to you. Thus we did to them, deliver them from the hands of the sons of Israel. They did not kill them. But Joshua made them hewers of wood and drawers of water from the congregation for the altar to this day and, the, and, and so forth. So, okay. So basically they tricked them into this treaty. Now, P Putin's kind of doing something similar here where he's kind of trying to say, oh, no, I'm not going to invade while he keeps moving troops in. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that. I just I want to come to a negotiation. I want to come to an agreement. It's kind of it's kind of like who's who's got the leverage here, right? That's the question. Does NATO and America have the leverage over Putin or does Putin now teaming up with all of the Middle East minus Israel and China? Do they have the leverage? Who's really got the leverage? Who's got the upper hand here? Right. So he can say, oh, I'm just a poor I'm just a poor guy from far away in Russia. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, we're not the USSR anymore. We're not very powerful. You know, we can't really do much. But mm, we do have a few nuclear weapons. And, you know, uh, we are kind of teaming up with some other people. And, um, and yeah, we're just doing some exercises on the border of Ukraine. But anyway, hey, I'd like to make a, make a deal. What, what do you say you guys just move out? Hmm? What do you guys just say you're not going to put anything in, you, in the Ukraine? You put anything on our border and we'll all be good. Life will go on. How does that sound? So he's kind of playing this sort of meek, you know, the meek bear, you know, because Russia's the bear, right? But he's kind of meek. He's kind of like, oh, you know, we're not much. We're just Russia these days. We're not as powerful as you big U.S., you know. Meanwhile, he's gaining power and power and power. So to the point where he's got the whole world supporting him, right? And he's sitting there right on the border with hundreds of thousands of troops and all this equipment and just saying, hey, I just I just want to talk. <laughs> it's like the guy who sits the who comes and sits at the table and puts the gun on the table. And, and you know, he sit, pulls a pistol out, just sits on the table between you and say, hey, I just want to talk. <laughs> I just want to talk. That's all. I just want to, you know, I just want to make it a little agreement here. That That's all. That, no, no, I'm not going to do anything. Not, the gun, don't worry about the gun. Um, but I just want to talk. You know, I want to work something out between us. So that's how he's playing this game, guys. And he's he's like these guys from far away, you know, um, kind of using his meekness, using it. Oh, you know, we're just little old Russia. You know, it's deception, guys. It's deception. You have to understand this is the art of war. This is deception. And the Russians know how to play chess as good as they're, 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 they're the, some of the best in the world. Right. If not the best next to like Bobby Fischer or somebody. Um, but the Russians know how to play this game. They're, they're good at the game, okay? They did it back in the Cuban Missile Crisis. They're doing it again now. They're good at the game. It's what they do. It's their whole culture, you know, the whole KGB and the culture. And everybody's deceptive there because you, you don't want to be taken away to the gulag. So everybody's always lying to each other and trying to, you know, save face because they can't speak their the real mind. So they're not going to tell you what they're really thinking, what they're really feeling. So that's one example in the Bible. I want to share another story with you if I can. Let's see how it, how it goes here. Um, and that's with King Hezekiah. Man, what is going on? I don't understand why it's doing this. Um, it's really weird. Um, but anyway, I want to share the story with King Hezekiah, and I'll probably just end up having to read it in whatever version is going to work for me here. Um, but King Hezekiah had, had kind of a similar uh, different, a different kind of situation, but another one to kind of learn, learn from, uh, when it comes to your enemies and what you share with your enemies. And so I think it applies. And then I'm going to look at some other, other things, some new things in the scriptures, uh, that talk about uh, something that needs to happen before the Arpazo, before everything goes down. 
and then I'm going to look at a few news things, and then we'll, we'll wrap up our time together. But here it says, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to him and said, This is what the Lord's... Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I'm going to let's go further down here. Verse 12. Okay, envoys from Babylon. Okay, at that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the messengers and showed them all that was in his storehouse. Okay, so they're coming to him like, oh, poor Hezekiah, we really care about you, right? We really care about you. We just want to come and give you some gifts and make sure you're okay. We heard you were sick, you know, and we're really concerned, right? And of course, clueless Hezekiah, right? Doesn't question this. Doesn't say, uh-huh, you're really concerned about me. Right. Uh-huh. Sure you are. Oh, they're like, oh, thanks for the gifts. Oh, that's nice. And then he's like, well, let me show you around. And they're like, yeah, show us around, would you? Show, give us the tour. Let us case the joint, Hezekiah. So Hezekiah received the messengers and showed them all that was in his storehouse, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine oil, his armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Ah, oh, wasn't that nice? How giving, how open and sharing and friendly he is with these nice people that came from Babylon that just were concerned about his health. Well, then, has a, then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say? And where did they come from? Because Isaiah is a smart guy, right? He's shrewd. He's a prophet. He's spiritual, right? He, he thinks about these things, right? Clueless Hezekiah, you know, kind of like Saul or somebody, just kind of a clueless king, right? And just kind of is not thinking wise, wisely, right? You need to stay, you need to inquire of the Lord, right? Isaiah is inquiring of the Lord. Same thing happened in the other situation, right? Where, um, you know, where they find out later, you know, uh, they, they didn't inquire of the Lord, and so they got tricked, right? And then they find out later, and now they're kind of stuck. Well, Isaiah is kind of the same thing. You know, Isaiah is coming in and saying, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Who were those guys, and why were you showing them everything, right? And Isaiah is like, um, well, they came from a distant land. They came from Babylon. You know, the prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? Well, they saw everything in my palace, as the guy said. There's nothing among my treasures that I didn't show them. <laughs> why, why do you ask, Isaiah? <laughs> Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left. Guys, this is the foreshadowing of what happened to Daniel and everybody else being taken to Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar came and took all the treasures. Right? Because good old Hezekiah was nice enough to share those with him. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of, your, of some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, that will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs, i.e. they're going to have their testicles cut off, in case you didn't know what a eunuch was. They will become eunuchs in the palace of the king at Babylon. And how does he think Hezekiah kind of responds? you think he tore, tore his garments and was like, oh, are you no, what have I done? Oh, no. Uh, why did I do that? I was so foolish. Oh, I didn't think. Oh, art of war, Sun Tzu, you know. <laughs> I didn't inquire of the Lord, right? He didn't need Sun Tzu. He needed God, right? He needed to talk to God. Isaiah was inquiring of the Lord. That's why he knew this. Hezekiah wasn't. So Hezekiah didn't get humble and didn't say, oh, you man, you're so right. I'm, I'm so sorry. Oh, I need to repent. What can I do to fix this? Which the damage is done at that point. No. What does he respond? He says, oh, well, the word of the Lord you have spoken is, is good. Hmm. That's, that's nice. He says Hezekiah replied. I mean, after he tells him your own kids are going to become eunuchs right? Your own flesh and blood. He's like, oh, oh, that's nice. So for he thought, will there not be peace and safety, peace and security in my lifetime? Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Peace and security. There it is again. Peace and security. The same thing the UN says when they put a big giant rainbow painted flying jaguar in front of their thing and they say oh don't worry that represents peace and security isn't that nice peace and safety when they're saying peace and safety whammo hezekiah babylon's gonna come on you like white on rice it's gonna come down and take all your treasures you done done it now hezekiah 
you foolish man. It says, as for the other events of Hezekiah's reign, all his achievements, how he made, et cetera, et cetera. They're never, and Hezekiah went and rested with his fathers. But Hezekiah didn't care. See, he only cared about himself. He was selfish, and he wasn't inquiring of the Lord. And that's what happens when you're selfish, self-focused, and you don't inquire of the Lord, and you're, you do dumb things like that, and you give away your whole plan, your whole strategy, give away your whole, all your treasures. And then the enemy comes and destroys you. And that's basically what we got leading our country right now. We got someone like a Hezekiah who's just kind of a bumbling fool and with a lot of other bumbling fools who've just managed to get in the right place at the right time um, to steal everything away from us. And, uh, and now they're going to let other people steal it, steal it from us, steal it from them, I guess you could say, um, because that's all part of their plan to destroy it all. So a couple examples there. I just kind of want to give you those little examples kind of in the art of war. In both cases, you know, a war it related to war because the Israelites were going to invade the Gibeonites. They, they kind of got shrewd and they hmm, how can we avoid this? Let's make a treaty with them under a different pretext. Kind of like in the time of Daniel when the wise men came and forced the, the hand of the king into a treaty then turned up working against Daniel and then he was all upset because he got tricked. Same thing happened with the king of Esther's time. Gets, gets tricked into making a treaty against the Israelites. These aren't very bright people, guys. I mean, you know, you got to wonder why why you would continue to say, allow the same line of people to reign a country from the same inbreeding and just uh, wickedness, you know, like Henry VIII and, and so forth. I mean, it's insane. You know, it's insane. So that's what was going on here, right? And so you got these dumb kings who aren't inquiring, foolish kings, I should just say. They're being foolish, behaving foolishly and not inquiring of the Lord. And that's what you have to do, guys. In the time of battle, we got to seek God. We're in a spiritual battle now. We may not be Putin. We may not be representing a country. But we're representing our own lives, and we have to, we have to, we have to fight this wisely, right? And so, uh, whether it's being deceived by the enemy, or in this case, showing the enemy everything, that's also not very bright. You know, as Christians, we're kind of not very bright because we want to, we want to be out in the open, want to let our light shine, right? Well, that's good, but we still got to be shrewd. We can't just show them all the treasures because the devil will come and it, it will he will destroy you and take everything that you have. So, just a couple things to learn from there. Okay. Now, I want to bring us up to speed. Shift gears here a little bit and talk a little bit about Damascus. Damascus. Ah, Damascus. Okay. So, you may have heard a little bit about Damascus and um, let me see if I can make this well I guess you can see what you need to see there as far as Damascus is concerned let me back it up just a little though just I just kind of want to briefly show you the whole picture even though it's getting kind of small on the screen there but uh, yeah okay that's probably a little too small okay well I wanted to show you a little bit down down at the bottom is where the Amalekites are but we're not talking about them right now so that's okay um, so anyway so Damascus okay Damascus. You might have heard about Damascus. Uh, Saul in, in the Bible um, was actually going to, he was on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him and spoke to him um, as a bright light um, and spoke to him and said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting and, and blinded Saul. That was on the road to Damascus. So he was going from Israel here, as you can see, kind of where, uh, well, if you look to see, there's Jerusalem there, uh, the star, right, in the, in the lower pink area to the left. And so he's going out, and he's going up to Damascus, which is up there in the north, to kind of the upper right where there's a star there. So those are like the capitals of, of the, that area. So that area is called Syria. And uh, we've looked at maps before in other, other, other videos where we talk about the different nations that are going to come, and they're going to surround Jerusalem and attack Jerusalem, right? And so um, just, just as we looked at that, Interestingly enough, we didn't talk much about Syria because Syria wasn't included in those names. However, Damascus is where Syria is, so so there so Syria is on the map as well, just in in other in, in another another scripture in other scriptures um, than the ones we looked at in Ezekiel specifically, and Saudi Arabia was an, is another one that's going to get pulled in there as well, but Damascus is is very significant, and let me show you why. Okay, if you look in Isaiah. 17, there's a prophecy that talks about Damascus, and it says, The oracle concerning Damascus it says, Behold, Damascus is about, see, there it goes again. 
I will never use this browser again. Don't worry. <laughs> this is the last <laughs> time I should ever have this problem. Uh, it's just crazy. Okay, so of course, I don't know why it's doing that. But anyway, Isaiah 17 says, The oracle concerning Damascus, Behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become a fallen ruin. Okay, well, that hasn't happened yet. Okay, Damascus is still around. It's one of the oldest cities ever. Um, the, the Arameans, the descendants of Aram, are the, are the Damascans, you could say. Um, if you look back here, let me go back to this map again. So you see the kingdom of Aram of Damascus, of Aram Damascus. So Aram was a descendant of Shem. Shem, um, oh, I'm losing track of, track of my thought. Shem is one of Noah's sons, right? So Shem, uh, yeah. So, um, so Aram is a descendant of Shem. I'm confusing him with Seth, but not Seth. Seth is Adam, Adam and Eve. Shem is with Noah. Okay, so uh, Aram, so they're one of the oldest peoples. What I'm trying to say is they're one of the oldest people that exist. That's one of the oldest ter territories, oldest towns, oldest places, descendant of one of Noah's sons, okay? But they've also been at odds with, in fact, all these people, the, the Ammonites, the Moabites, you know, you can trace them all back to different people that came out, out of Abraham's line for the most part. Um, but they became enemies, ultimately. And so God basically said in, there in Isaiah 17, he says, Damascus is going to be destroyed. The city is going to be in ruins. So, um, and, that, and that's, what, that's the oracle concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become fallen ruin. Okay. Well, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't become a fallen ruin. Now, there are other cities in the Bible that, 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 that holds true like the city of Tyre, for example. And there are, other, there are other ones in the Bible where God cursed it and, and it got destroyed. But Damascus has been this one that's kind of been this sort of like thorn in the side. You always hear about Damascus, Damascus and Syria and, you know, between Israel and Syria. And so lately it's flaring up again, okay? And so this is another reason that will, that will put a hook into the jaw of the Prince of Rosh and pull him down to Israel. Right? We read about that in Ezekiel. Go watch the other videos for that. Um, but the Prince of Rosh and Gog, Gog and Magog are going to come down with all those other nations we talked about, and they're going to surround Jerusalem. And technically, they're already surrounding Jerusalem because the nations literally surround Jerusalem, and those armies are assembling. So you could argue they're already surrounding it, but, but odds are they're going to tighten in a lot more than they are currently uh, on Jerusalem, kind of like they are in Ukraine right now. But why would Russia get involved? Well, that's... That's the question, right? Well, let's take a look here. Israel, and this is just this is recent news. Um, this is in this is in the last. Let me see if it has the date here. Okay, so this is uh, February seventeenth. Okay, right. So that's that's today actually. It's saying, but this is this has just happened, guys. Um, Israel attacks targets in south of Damascus. Now, it says they're carrying out the attack using surface-to-surface -surface missiles, causing some material damage with no casualties. It's saying that they're, re that they're re responding to some missiles that came to them, right? So they're retaliating. But they're specifically targeting Damascus, okay? And this is one thing that we're waiting for, too, is to see Damascus finally be destroyed. Now, I, you know, I, I feel for the people in Damascus. Damascus is a nice town. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see anybody destroyed. But... It is one of the prophecies that God gave that Damascus would be ruins, um, would be brought to ruins. And it would tie in, it's logical that it would tie in with why Ru uh, Russia would get involved and why they would come down and surround Jerusalem, right? Because that's ultimately what we're leading to is how does Russia get pulled down? As it says in Ezekiel 38, there will be like a hook in his jaw to pull him down, to turn him around. So right now he's up there in Ukraine and he's going in that direction. But there's this action that's going on down here in Israel and Damascus that may ultimately be be the turning point to get Russia involved. It says, Israel accused of striking Syria hours after Assad met Russian defense minister. Now, Russia has a relationship with the head of Syria, and, and that's where Damascus is, and it's, it's, it's the capital of Syria. So Russia uh, has a relationship with Assad, 
and they want to, they're, they like that relationship. They want to keep that relationship going. And so at the same time, they also have a relationship with Israel, right? But the, but the problem is right now is that everybody in that region except Israel, right? Or I should say Israel is the only one in that region who also happens to be an ally and part of NATO, connected with NATO, a NATO ally, an American ally, right? So as much as they have a positive relationship that they want to keep going, Russia and Israel, they're quickly becoming enemies just by definition. Because if they remain the only place left that's a NATO American ally in a whole region of people that just want to destroy uh, America and Israel, they're, they're definitely outnumbered and outmanned and outsized. And if Russia's in a position where he's going to consolidate the Middle East to be part of his team, he's got this kind of thorn in his side with this Israel stick in there, right? And as much as Israel wants to keep that relationship going, Russia kind of knows Israel's already America's baby, right? Or has been. Now, now that the lunatics have taken over, that may not continue, right? And who's really going to come to Israel's defense? And that's probably why ultimately God is going to come to the defense of Israel because they're going to move in around Israel and America may not be there to, to, to defend them because although America as a country may have an agreement with Israel, the leaders have a whole nother idea of what they want to happen. And they may just stand back and let it happen, in which case God is going to come in and bring about that earthquake and the destruction that we read about in Ezekiel and in Matthew, Mark and Luke and in Revelation 6. So that's that's what's going on here, guys. There's there's a dance going on between Israel, Russia. You know, Russia's kind of stayed out of it. Israel and Syria have kind of been been fighting each other here and there with little skirmishes, and Russia's kind of kept their kept their distance. But now that this is coming together and lines are being drawn in the sand, and Israel's kind of in a point like, man, who am I going to side with? Am I going to go with Israel? Or am I going with Ukraine? Am I a NATO, I'm a NATO ally, but I'm kind of outnumbered here. I'm in the middle of the Middle East, and I'm surrounded. You know, as Israel's thoughts. You know, they're surrounded. And is America really going to come to our rescue? They didn't save Afghanistan, so are they going to save us? What's what's going on here? You know, what's going down? Let's look at a couple other articles here. It says, Russia cites deep concern over ongoing Israeli strikes in Syria. So Russia's already concerned about the situation. But like I said, I think it's going to go beyond that. I think it's going to be an issue of Israel, you know, Syria is our ally and Israel isn't technically because they're part of NATO, they're a NATO ally, they're an American ally, and we are now going into war against America and NATO, and therefore Israel has now become our enemy. You know, it's, it's the, 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 the friend of my, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, in the same way, the friend of my enemy is my enemy, right? And so that's, that's what's kind of going on now as lines are being drawn in the sand. If you look here, it says Russia sends warplanes hypersonic missiles to Syria for major naval drills. So we, what we're seeing in the news is there's a lot of support of Russia for Syria, not a lot of support from Russia for Israel, right? They have a relationship, and, and, and uh, you know, Bennett, Naftali Bennett is, is working hard to try to keep that relationship going strong because he doesn't want to be an enemy of Russia. But Russia's not really reciprocating and, like, giving Israel a whole lot of help, but they really are helping Syria, and they're helping Iran, and they're helping other countries that are enemies of Israel, right? So you kind of see where this is going. And now as Russia is being forced to become an enemy of NATO in the U.S., which during the blonde-haired uh, man's uh, time, I'll just say, in office, we had peace, right? There were no wars, right? And things with Russia were good. Things with North Korea were good. Things were good because that's how they should be. That's how they really ought to be. That's how they really would be with any logical thinking person in in office or in power uh you know there's no reason for us to be fighting each other but for those who want to destroy the world they want to get the fight going that's that's all they're about they want to get this war underway so russia is sending down their hypersonic missiles into syria for major na naval drills um if you look here russia has been doing military intervention in syria since 2015 right it's in the syrian civil war so for seven years they've been down there helping out syria so they're kind of used to that there's a relationship built. They're the ones actually who helped Assad stay in power because he was about to be taken out. Now, supposedly Assad, you know, the media made him out to be the guy massacring everybody. Other people say, no, he's actually a good guy who helped the Christians. 
I, you know, I, I don't, I, I haven't studied that in, in depth, so I'm not going to make any statements about that myself. All I can say is Russia has been involved and they were the ones that helped Assad to stay in power. So you can kind of see where this is going, right? Um, if you look here, will Israel be forced to choose between Russia and the Ukraine? So that's basically where this is coming to. And will Russia be forced to choose between Syria and Israel and, 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 and these other countries at Israel, right? They're, they're kind of out, um, outnumbered. They're outgunned and outnumbered. And, you know, Russia has to weigh, hmm, I'm going to get a lot more mileage out of my relationships with Iran and out of my relationships with Syria and my relationships with all these other countries than I am with Israel. In fact, Israel and I are competitors because we both have oil. We both want to make money routing that oil. And so really we're in competition with each other. So Israel is being forced because now they, they got to say Ukraine delivers 50% of our grain. As we talked about in other things, that's a fulfillment of Revelation 6 as the wheat and the barley prices go through the roof in Israel because that all comes from the Ukraine, right? And now, you know, as and many news, news outlets have talked about this actually, which is, is really cool because none of them are actually getting that this is actually biblical prophecy being fulfilled. But they're talking about the fact that, you know, it's like the, imagine just cutting cutting your whole diet in half, you know, all the bread you have has just now been cut in half because they provide 50% of Israel's grain. So that's going to drive prices through the roof for, for wheat and barley, just as it says in Revelation 6. So uh, 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 Israel has to make the choice, you know, what are we going to do here? You know, we need Ukraine because we need, we need the barley, we need the wheat, we need, we need what they provide, the oil as well. We need all that. But at the same time, we don't want to be enemies with Russia because otherwise, because they got everybody surrounding us and we're in a lot of trouble if that happens. And that's exactly what's going to happen, guys. That's prophecy as well. And that prophecy is going to be fulfilled just like all the other prophecies that are being fulfilled. Hey, Chad, what's happening? Thanks for your comments. Russia has been helping Assad kill over 70,000 of their Syrian citizens. Yeah, exactly. Like I say, I, I haven't studied their involvement in Syria as much. I just know that they have kept, kept Assad in power. I know that much. And um, that's why he's still in power to today. So, uh, right, exactly. The fact that Russia has supported them. I think the real, Chad says, I think the real country to watch is Turkey. Turkey is part of the Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog, Magog prophecy, but Turkey is in NATO. Sometimes soon Turkey will support Russia and Iran. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Turkey, what 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 comes about there with, uh, with Turkey as they... Uh, because they also are kind of in this sort of neutral-ish position, you know, because they're in NATO, but they're involved with Russia. You're right. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Turkey progresses as well. Let's uh, let's look at a couple more things and I'll kind of wrap up our time. Any other comments you guys want to make? Um, here again, it says Ukraine has been Israel's main wheat supplier for many years, according to almost half accounting for almost half of the country's wheat consumption as of 2022 israel imports corn and corn products barley barley rapeseed which is oil and soybeans which is also oil you could say agriculture exports to israel exceed 400 million so again and we looked at this last time with the 10 plagues you write this first article the 10 plagues facing israel the first thing on the list is grain the first thing on the list is wheat and the second is barley <laughs> and that's exactly what it says when it talks about uh, the third, uh, the, the horseman, um, is it the third, I believe it's, is it, I think it's the third horseman, um, that is the horseman talking about the wheat prices and the, and the barley prices going through the roof and don't damage the oil and the wine, right? Because they're also exporting, they want to export to Ukraine and they need those exports to go to Ukraine because they got to get, they got to get their wheat supply and they're not going to get it if Ukraine is being compromised in the midst of all that. So very powerful things are happening here, guys. And Damascus is on the list as well. Is see what I'm in, what I'm thinking is Damascus going to get is is Damascus going to get finally destroyed and ruined as it says in Isaiah 17, and then that's going to make Russia kind of bring down the hammer, the hammer and the sickle from the USSR. They're going to bring down their hammer, and they're finally going to get involved, and they're finally going to say, okay, that's it, Israel. Now you've destroyed Damascus. I, I'm, I got to get involved now, and they're going to get involved. And pull those nations, and those nations are chomping at the bit to surround Israel, and so Russia is going to end up coming down with everybody, and they're going to surround Israel, and that's the moment where God is going to have to step in, and whammo with the earthquake and the destruction, and that's it, man. That's then, then the prophecies will be fulfilled, and uh, Matthew 
uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke can be fulfilled and Revelation 6 can be fulfilled and we can all finally go home and or finally the wrath of God will will will, will, will kick in. Um, so both. I mean, the wrath of God will finally be unleashed and then God will, will as Isaiah 26 say, says, take us and protect us. We will escape the wrath that is about to come on the earth. That's the plan. So that's our prayer. That's what we want to happen, right? Uh, we just got to be walking with God and, and pray that uh, that he will take us at, at the right time and trust that he will. But, um, you know, those are the prophecies that need to be fulfilled. Those are things that need to happen for all those things to come together. Russia's defense minister meets serious Assad for talks. So Russia is really involved with Syria and they've been involved for a long time. Um, so in closing, let's just look at it. I'll just kind of have some news, see kind of some of the, the news that's going on lately. Uh, this is a site. Uh, that I've shown you guys before, War News 24-7. It's a Greek site. You can translate it into English, which is what I've done here. Um, let's just look at some of these. Vertical scaling, a nuclear agreement with Russia, Belarus. He was expelled, the deputy ambassador of the USA in Moscow. So the ambassador of the USA in Moscow has been ex has been expelled, been, ex been deported. Uh, it was another way it was phrased. Uh, white smoke from the embassy of Russia in Kiev. Dramatic strengthening of the Russian forces on the border. So... We're going into something, guys. They're not pulling out, that's for sure. Heavy exchanges of fire between Ukrainian and Russian-speaking people in the Donbass sailed the fleet Caspian. Okay, so there's fire going on already. Blackout in the I have Ukraine, a raging hard conflict, Britain in a critical situation. Uh, Putin is asking the UN to legitimize Russian business in Ukraine, sent a folder with five mass graves. Okay, yeah, so Putin is asking, and it wasn't business the way they translated it in the other one, but basically Putin is asking the U.N. to be able to, to clear him for going in because they're claiming that they found, you know, and you don't know what's true. That's the thing. You don't know what's true, what's propaganda, and what's just kind of used, you know, what's, what's Gulf of Tonkin? What are they just using as a, as, a, as a manipulative tool so they can get this war going? But Putin is now asking to go, asking the U.N. for permission because they want it to be, you know, uh, you know, sanctify. They want it to be uh, something that doesn't cause the war. So, hey, we want to go in and, and deal with these graves. We found these mass graves of Russians, uh, supposedly, in the Donbass region. And so they're requesting the permission so that it's uh, they understand, hey, this is what we're doing. We're not, we're not trying to start a war. Either. We just want to deal with these mass graves. But, of course, once they're in, they're in, right? I mean, once they're in. So very interesting things. How things are developing here. But ultimately, guys, Ukraine is not the goal. Ukraine is just kind of kicking it off, right? Ultimately, it's going to move south. It's moving down to the Middle East, and we can already kind of see that brewing as Russia is sending their planes down there, and they're flying along the Israeli border doing patrols with Syria, et cetera. Um, so we can see where that's going. So I, I, I'm kind of feeling that Damascus may be that tipping point, um, that Damascus finally does come to ruin, and then that's the moment that really – forces Putin's hand to come down and kind of try to put the hammer on Israel and surround Israel. And at that point, that's, that's when those prophecies will finally be fulfilled. So, uh, it's, it's, it's exciting times, guys. We're living in exciting times. We're living in the end times. I mean, that, that in itself is exciting that God has chosen you out of all the times you could have lived on the earth. He chose you to live now during the end times, during the end of the world. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I mean, it's awesome, you know, and I, ever since this has begun, you know, the more I get close to God, the more I think about these things, the, the, the more peaceful I feel, the peace that passes understanding because, it, you know, you can't understand it because you would think by worldly terms, you should be anxious, you should be afraid, you should be, oh no, this is the end of the world, what's going to happen? But when you understand that this is all part of God's plan and it's coming together and this is all getting closer to Jesus's return and us going to be with him. And, and, and raining on the earth and, and finally being done with all this mess of this world, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty awesome. Let's see what other things Chad said here. Uh, did you see that Ukraine signed a security treaty with the UK and Poland in the last 48 hours? No, I haven't seen that yet. Um, I've been watching the news, um, but it's so much to take in. I, I may not have caught it. So they signed a security treaty with the UK and Poland in the last 40 hours. No, I didn't catch that. Um, that's interesting. So meaning, meaning what? That the UK and Poland are going to support them, even though they're not part of NATO, they are going to kind of treat them as though they are and sort of uh, uh, provide security for them? Is that, is that what we're talking about? UK and Poland are in NATO. 
Yes. So basically, if Russia attacks Ukraine, the UK and Poland will get drawn in. And when Russia attacks UK or Poland assets, then it would be considered an attack against NATO. Right. Yeah. And then, then it's World War Three. Then that's World War Three. You know, then everybody's involved at that point. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. That's that's powerful stuff. Um, some sites that I, I look at, um, you know, there's there's a lot of great news channels out, out there um, that are bringing it to you. Um, but uh, some are, one I look at is Deep Journal and Crux and also, uh, uh, what's the other one? The Off Grid, the Off Grid guys, those are, they're pretty good too. Um, just kind of bringing it to you. Um, they look a lot at this site, this War News 24-7 uh, site, because this, this site tends to be a, a kind of on the cutting edge of, I guess, the most exciting, intense things that are happening. Um, another site is, um, uh, what is it? Is it Truss or Pruss? Uh, I'm forgetting it. Trass or Prass or something. I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting exactly the name of it. Um, there's some other good sites out there, too, that are reporting on this stuff. But the mainstream news is not going to give it to you because they want to paint a different picture. They're trying to paint a picture that America's in control and that Russia's the aggressor and Russia's the one doing wrong and all that. So they're not going to show you the whole the whole picture, right? There's no good guys here, guys. <laughs> Everyone's sinful. Everyone's sinful. Um, there's no right. The only right and wrong is God. You know, God is the right and the rest of us are wrong. Like God be true and every man a liar. So. You know, ultimately, uh, you we though we are evil know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more will our heavenly Father give good give good give, give good gifts to us? So, um, you know, that's what we have to keep in mind. You know, it's not like it's not like rooting for your favorite football team or something. You know, this is a situation of of evil. You know, it's just evil unleashed, and war is ugly, and it's never there is no. As they say, all is fair in love and war. Well, all is unfair, right, in war. I mean, there's nothing really that's good about war. And most people that have been in war would agree with that. You know, they're pretty uh, they're pretty sober about war, you know, because it's, yes, it's a sort of an exciting thing in, a, in, a, in, in that it gets us ex not excited in a, in a happy way, but excited in, a, in a, an adrenaline way, you know, that we get kind of charged and, and worked up about what's going on. But we got to be praying for this situation. We got to be praying for people's protection. You know, God, that God protects the people who in Ukraine, the people throughout the world that are in the middle of all this. You know, they're just trying to live their lives. We think we're trying to live our lives and go back to normal. Imagine these guys uh, who are in these countries. Imagine the people in Ukraine right now, how they're feeling. Imagine the people in Damascus, you know, who apparently are dealing with bombings all the time and Israel. You know, in places that where you're always getting bombed. You know, it's just kind of, hey, oh, another bomb today. Okay, great. Well, I um, guess I'm going to get back to lunch, you know. I mean, they, they are kind of used to it, I guess, in some ways. I mean, they, they're saying the people in Ukraine are just kind of going about their business and they're not really thinking much about it, which I suppose is good in a way. Ignorance is bliss, you know. But um, we just got to pray for their protection and, and pray for wisdom on the part of leaders and, and pray for uh, Jesus' quick return, that this doesn't, isn't dragged out for a long time. Hopefully it won't be this long war. But, you know, it's interesting, the war, it does talk about in the, in the Revelation 6, you know, that's the only time it, it seems to talk about, I may be wrong because if we look at Babylon, but when I think about talking about war in the end times, there's not a lot talked about in terms of war other than this war that we're waiting on, which appear, you know, is talked about in Revelation 6, prior to Arpazo and prior to, you know, uh, Revelation 7, where we're all standing before Christ. Um, and, and then there's like the final war where Jesus comes back um, and kills everybody with the sword from his mouth. Uh, you know, kill those, not everybody, but kills those who, are, who he's fighting against. Um, but in between, you know, it does say that Babylon is destroyed in a day or in an hour, but we don't exactly know how. That's something I want to talk about in another video, but um, but that's just something to think about. That this is kind of has to happen. You know, there's wars and rumors of wars, as Jesus says. But then, then that part's done, and then it's God's turn. And then God's like, okay, now now my now it's my turn, and He brings the wrath, and um, and that really is the the time of Jacob's trouble, and the and the and the real end comes. So, 
in any case guys exciting times um be be watchful you know be watchful and be understanding that the news is lying to you the mainstream media that the the commercial media i guess i should call it i don't know what mainstream really means anymore but because they're not even mainstream anymore most people don't even watch that stuff but be aware of it you know it's a lot of people are brainwashed and programmed by the commercial media um who uh you know are bringing you this this fake agenda and you know, they've been do they've been doing it for decades now they've been doing it about everything that we've gone through um you know they, they create the race wars they create the gender wars they create anything just to cause division they just want to divide us divide and conquer so just keep that in mind and keep in mind the shrewdness of what's happening here you know when when, when a leader's saying one thing they mean another at least the shrewd ones you know like a putin i think it's pretty safe to say i mean you look at putin that's a shrewd guy you can just tell <laughs> this guy the, the wheels are turning there you know he's 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 always kind of maneuvering so there's a shrewd guy there but ultimately his the hook will be put in his jaw by the lord he ultimately won't be the deciding factor god is the one who's determined this and this is what's going to happen according to god's will according to scripture so exciting it's coming together it's happening as we speak we're seeing it we're seeing it unfold it's very it's really it's riveting you know it's very riveting so uh Chad, thank you for putting in the effort to share the information. May God bless you. Amen, Chad. Thank you so much. Thanks for your comments. I appreciate you chiming in and adding your comments. And thank you all for uh, tuning in today. And uh, let me know more of your comments in the chat box and, in, and, uh, and below. If you can help support our channel, then I can do more of this and come back because I'd love to do it more. Um, and uh, thank you for the new subscribers who've, who've joined our channel. And um, thank you guys for all your thoughts and comments. Uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his, make his face shine upon you and give you peace. And uh, may you walk with him and get close to him during this time. Make sure, make sure you you repent of your sins. You know, get get the sin out of your life and turn back to God. Read Galatians five about the, the acts of the sinful nature being obvious. Those who live like that will not inherit the kingdom of God. So go check out Galatians five nineteen. And on, and then it talks about the fruits of the Spirit as well. But those who live like that will not inherit the kingdom of God, guys. So you have to repent. You know, it's not just saying some prayer and feeling good about yourself. You got to repent. You got to turn back to God, and you have to walk with God. You love Him if you obey His commands. So this is in John fourteen fifteen. You know, go check that out. You know, as Jesus said to those who believed Him in John eight, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Right? We have to hold to his teaching, guys. We can't just listen to the word and deceive ourselves. We have to do what it says, like it says in James 1, James 2. You know, uh, you know, we're saved by what we do and not by faith alone, as it says in James 2. It actually says that in, Saint, in James 2. So go look, go look at those scriptures. Guys, we got to walk with God during these times. And we got to get close to him and we got to ask him to, to lead us, to guide us, to show us the way, to do his will. It's exciting to watch this. You grab the popcorn and you want to see the, the, what's happening. But don't be left behind. Don't be one of the virgins without the oil in your lamp, right? Make sure you're going to God and, and confessing your sins. You know, as James 5, confess your sins to one another. Pray for each other so you can be healed, right? So we have to confess our sins. We have to um, be honest, you know, about where we stand with God and good, bad, and ugly. And we got to ask for God's help. You know, we're not perfect, you know, but we got to ask for God's help and help, help to guide us and get us through. Amen? So... Thanks for tuning in, guys. Love you guys. I look forward to the next time and uh, appreciate all of the encouragement out there. And uh, stay strong. Stay faithful. It's The end is soon. It's very, very soon. You can see it. The writing is on the wall. I mean, as, as it says in Daniel, the writing is on the wall, guys. I mean, look at it. It's happening. It's right happening right in front of our eyes. So now we just have to pray that we're ready to go when the time comes. Amen? Because it's soon. All right, guys. God bless you. Love you, and I will talk to you again very soon, hopefully. <laughs> so uh, pray for me as well. Yeah, pray for my health. I, I can breathe and for my teeth. I have issues with my teeth as well, so if you can pray for that as well. I appreciate your prayers. And let me know your th what you need to pray for, and I'll be praying for you as well. All right, guys, love you guys. Thank you. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. I hope to see you soon, even more importantly. See ya.